So colleagues, welcome and good morning for those of you for whom it is the morning uh, to this Usher webinar from the University of Edinburgh. My name is Linda Bald, I'm a Professor of Public Health in the Usher. Um, and those of you who've joined us in the past will know that we have introduced this webinar series to discuss uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, to learn from countries around the world and to gather actionable insights that can be useful to colleagues both working in research in practice in the health services or elsewhere, and indeed in government. And we're joined by listeners uh, from a range of countries, not just uh, the UK. So what I'm gonna do just for the next minute is remind colleagues who are listening in today of the process for the webinar. And then I'll be delighted to introduce our speaker today who is from South Korea. Uh, so just the process, um, as you know, you're not able to share your audio or your video feed. I, I apologize for that because I know some other webinar formats, you can see others who have joined, but there are hundreds of people on the line and that's not feasible. Um, you will have questions as the, um, as the webinar progresses. Please post your questions in the Q&A panel, which you can see in the Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat box, which is a separate function. And you will be able to see other people's questions, which is something my, a, a colleague asked last week. If you click on that box, you'll be able to see the other questions that people are asking and you can, um, you can press the positive sign for those that you particularly would like answered, which is very helpful to me because then I can see um, the priority of the questions. Uh, so the webinar is being recorded. As you know, it's being live streamed now on YouTube so people can watch again. Um, and Professor Kim, who is our speaker, has very generously offered for his slides to be shared as a PDF afterwards. And so just a couple of words of thanks, as I've uh, done every week, to Aziz Sheikh, our director in the Usher, who set up this webinar series, and to Susan Buckingham and colleagues in the Usher communications team. So I'll introduce our speaker now. Uh, he's Professor Jerome Kim, who's the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul in South Korea. He's also a professor within the Division of Infectious Diseases of the Department of Medicine at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. And he has a long and very distinguished career uh, in relation to infectious disease and a whole uh, range of other aspects of research. So we're really delighted that he's been able to join us. I'm gonna hand over to Professor Kim now and, and we'll hear from him and then have questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bolt. And uh, let's just see if I can handle the technical aspects Not of this. Well. Take your time. <laughs> okay. Great. And then... That's perfect, so we can see that. Okay. Wonderful. All right, so... Thanks again, Professor Bold, and thanks to the Usher Institute, the University of Edinburgh, um, for this opportunity to speak at the COVID-19 uh, webinar series. Uh, I'm the head of the International Vaccine Institute, which is the only international organization um, that really, uh, whose mission is to discover, develop, and deliver safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for global health. And as an example, the IVI's oral cholera vaccine is the uh, stockpile for oral cholera vaccine around the world. And, um, and it's sold for the, uh, at, at a very reasonable price of $1.30 a dose. And so that is our mission and, our, and we are committed to bringing uh, vaccine technology and innovation uh, to populations around the world. So I, in the beginning of 2020, I mean, I, I think none of us were thinking about this at Christmas time. Uh, in, uh, of last year. But remember that these pandemics uh, come and go. And this is just a slide to remind us um, that, you know, a pandemic can strike anywhere. It has a network across the world and its only purpose is to kill. And I think everyone is thinking, oh my goodness, this is terrorism. No, in fact, this was AIDS uh, in 1993. But the world has seen other pandemics, you know, the Black Death, 1562, well, actually throughout the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. Um, smallpox, this is the Chinese god of smallpox. Um, it's been around for 3,000 years, uh, sorry, 3,000 years before the common era, and then all the way till 1979 when it was eliminated by a vaccine. Um, cholera, the Blue Death, actually has been in seven worldwide pandemics. We are currently in the seventh global pandemic for cholera. And of course, the Spanish flu, the, you know, the once in a century event, and maybe we are in the second, the, the, the once in a lifetime event of, of our uh, century. Let's see. Oops. 
Okay. And of course, COVID-19. So coronavirus taxonomy and host range, I mean, um, being a scientist and being a former sequencer, I have to show you the uh, phylogenetic tree. Um, you can see the beta coronavirus is group 2B here and with the red um, circle around it is, are the SAR, is the SARS CoV, that's the original SARS-CoV, uh, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 would cluster in, in roughly the same location. Coronaviruses are a promiscuous family of mammalian RNA viruses, promiscuous in the sense that they can hop from species to species. They're not specific, for instance, for humans or for bats necessarily, or for spiny ant eaters, uh, as we know now. Um, and you can see that actually in, in the uh, inset on the bottom right, and let's see if I can get to it there. Uh, here, uh, where, where coronaviruses in bats and, and here in civets uh, with the original SARS-CoV, um, and now I think there we go, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which may have made a transition from bats into humans or, or maybe involved spiny ant ears. Um, in any case, uh, ended up in humans and, and we ended up with the disease um, we call COVID-19. Flattening in the curve in South Korea. So the South Korean model. And a lot has been said about this, um, but remember that South Korea had an opportunity to practice as Hong Kong did. Um, with Hong Kong, it was the SARS outbreak in 2002. With South Korea, it was the MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another coronavirus um, outbreak that occurred in 2015. So they had an opportunity. They'd been in, been in an outbreak situation before. And as you might expect, the first time you're in one of these big outbreaks yourself, you learn a few lessons. And so um, they did in fact learn a few lessons and, and some of them are summarized here. First is um, what we, and as a former military person, I call command control and communications. Um, a clear line of command from the prime minister down to the districts that are implementing the uh, Ministry of Health's directives. The decision-making was transparent, it was decisive, and it was data-driven uh, and not fear-driven. And that's actually really important because when you're in an outbreak situation, you don't always have the luxury of being able to sit back and kind of say, well, I think I'm gonna wait for the data I want. No, sometimes you have to make decisions based on the data that you have, but you need to justify them and make it clear why you're making the decisions. And sometimes, for instance, the ministry would use these things to talk about things that were troubling. And, and that's actually very important because it gives people the idea that, you know, the ministry is looking at data as it's coming in. And if you listen uh, to Dr. Burks from the United States, she often will emphasize how important the data are in understanding and dealing with the crisis uh, that the United States is, is trying to uh, overcome. Clear messages reinforced frequently. And it, it starts at the top with the you know, daily or twice daily briefings from the Ministry of Health, from the uh, person who's really the technical person in charge of this, who is the Vice Minister of Health, uh, but is also the director general of the Korea Center for Disease Control. The clear message are re reinforced, messages are reinforced frequently. In fact, the social distancing message comes up periodically on your cell phone as a warning or a reminder that, you know, to keep your distance, to use uh, good hand hygiene, cough, ha cough hygiene, and, and the idea that, that in protecting yourself, you're really, you really are protecting others. The other thing is that, you know, I don't think people realize that, that in Korea, there was no mandatory lockdown. This was really voluntary compliance and the use of information um, by the government uh, to keep people up to date, to let them know why the government was wanting them to do things and um, to help with uh, tracking and information. So, um, you know, and I, I'll just use this, this is, as an example. Um, you, our phone vibrates and you get this really annoying alarm and you look at it and it says something in Korean. So not speaking Korean, I'll have it translated in Google Translate and it says, uh, warning uh, in our area, which is Sodi Moon Gu, if you need more information, go to the website. So you go to the Sodi Moon Gu website and you click on it and it tells you, oh, someone was um, COVID-19 positive. It doesn't tell you who it was. So that an anonymity is preserved. And that person had visited your supermarket uh, and was, was seen on CCTV, so it was confirmed. And they were there between the hours of 10 a.m. and 10.15. So if you develop a cough or fever or shortness of breath, and you happen to be at the supermarket at that time, then maybe you should tell your healthcare provider and get tested. And testing, of course, is, um, is widely available. You can drive in to one of these drive-in test centers. You can go to one of the health centers or you can, and what the thing is in here, down here on the left is a phone booth testing center. 
So it's actually a reverse phone booth. The person actually walks in, but the healthcare worker is on the other side and is protected uh, and sticks uh, his or her, her hands out through the gloves. And you can see the little blue gloves uh, there. The, the booths are easier. They're actually faster. I think 60% I think was the number I saw once uh, faster than, than the drive-throughs. And so again, make it convenient and free for people who need to be tested to be tested. If you were tested positive uh, or you're the family member of someone who is positive, um, then you were isolated. And this isolation was, you know, you were given an app on your phone and, and you were kept there. Um, more recently, they've gone to mandatory isolation. Um, and, and that is because uh, there were some violators. And, you know, when the government sees that, again, using data, they, they often will make changes. One of the very important things, and, and this is actually even more important now, is tracking down uh, people. And the government has that authority, and I have a slide on it a bit later, on, on how the tracking is accomplished. But really, if we're now in the suppression phase and just in the, the phase where the government is being vigilant, being able to identify cases quickly, isolate them, and then identify the people who might have been exposed is really critical to keeping the outbreak small. And if we want to, to stay in the currently relaxed state, so I guess on Monday, the government of Korea removed the voluntary restrictions actually lowered several of the levels of alert. So for instance, um, you can go to church, you can go to the gym, you can go to a bar. Um, you know, these things were all allowed as the government relaxed some of the restrictions. And, and I think we're just waiting to see how that works. Um, and the government is as well. They're, they're very vigilant at this point. So as the governments are pre preparing for le release, what do they look at? And, you know, I mean, I'm sure the government in the UK and the governments in the United States, the state governments in that case, are thinking about what, what our criteria are going to be when we prepare for release. So many of us have seen the negative slopes uh, of numbers of deaths and then numbers of new cases. And it's really important to remember that those slopes are our windows into the past. For deaths, it's maybe five weeks in the past. For new infections, it's maybe 14 days in the past. So how many days of decrease do you need before you, you, you before you're, if you're a government, you determine that it's time to let go? And, and those are things uh, that a government can, can decide based on the data that it has. Where are the new infections coming from? You know, have we covered all of our bases? Um, you know, these are the kinds of things where you know, knowing the individual country's data are critical and, and every country uh, can be different. Hospital capacity. And, and, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to release all the restrictions if your hospitals are full, if you don't have enough ventilators. So part of, of the planning here is making sure that in case there is a surge of new cases, that you have the capacity to handle them. And that would mean having supplies, uh, personnel rested, adequate test kits and uh, protective equipment. Having the teams available for the, you know, the test, isolate, track and treat uh, programs. Do, does the government want to pilot this? Or do they want to release the restrictions from the entire country all at once? Again, there is no, as we say in America, smart book. There is no you know, pre-planned set of instructions that a government has. Every country, every state in the United States is doing it on its own. And, and there really isn't a, um, a manual that tells you what the best way is. So local data are gonna be critical. Being on top of the situation is also critical. Having the capacity to handle surge uh, is also critical. So this is a timeline of, of what went on in Korea. And actually, if you look at the far left-hand side, December 31st, the first cluster of cases, two weeks before that, and, and there was a report on this in the newspaper, the government hasn't confirmed it, but there was a tabletop exercise. So part of the lessons learned um, back in 2015 was that this is something that you don't do for the first time uh, when you're in it. So in, in December of 2019, the government of Korea did a tabletop exercise where two Koreans, a husband and wife, returned from China with a pneumonia. And there was an outbreak. And so they had uh, gathered a number of infectious disease experts and government officials, and they went through what Korea would do. And little did they know that, that two months later that they would be you know, up, up to their ears in um, an outbreak. So you can see here the alert levels. So the Korean government's um, Infectious Diseases Prevention and Control Act has levels. And, and it's a little confusing because actually level four, the red alert on the far right-hand side, um, is also actually sometimes called level three. 
Um, but in any case, the Korean government, based on the different um, situations, so that after the first confirmed case, the alert level goes from one, which is just basically acknowledgement that there is an outbreak of something somewhere in the world. Uh, once you have a case in Korea, you change to level two. Um, at level three, you, the Korean government is really um, worried. There, there are actually multiple cases. Um, and in level four, there's local um, spread. And, and so that's where they were in February 23rd of 2020. Um, and so all of these things follow a predictable pattern. Um, and one of the most important things, and I'll focus on this a bit later, is that as you go from level three to level four, the responsibility shifts from the Minister of Health to the Prime Minister. And again, reflecting the nature of the emergency and the types of resources that might be necessary in order to control the outbreak. Again, prior preparation prevents poor per performance. So, you know, the Korean government had seen this before. They knew what mistakes they had made before. They made uh, corrections or amendments to the law, and they, they put into place a system which they practiced and, and probably made a big difference as the outbreak ramped up. Oops. So again, this is the, again, the, um, the events, but now um, with the number of cases that were, were identified every day. And you can see, you know, as you ramp up testing, of course, you're going to increase greatly the number of cases. And I remember I was in Australia and um, countries were beginning to restrict um, flights to Korea and flights to Korea were being canceled. And so I almost was stuck in, in Australia as that was happening. You know, the, Korea remained open. Um, now it remains open to most countries, although you have to get a visa to enter. So there's not the same you know, visa on arrival system, but you know, Korea did keep its borders open. And if you were to come from Europe, you would be put into 14 days of quarantine, um, but the borders remain open. The use of information technology was very important. And I think um, interestingly, now we're reading about um, countries around the world developing their own software. Um, that will help them to, to use the kinds of, of things that were used in Korea uh, in order to inform the people, but also um, for, for their own purposes. So these free apps on your mobile telephone and or actually Corona map is something that you just get on the internet. Um, by clicking on, for instance, the little orange circle here, uh, let's see if I can, so if you click on that little orange circle, um, it'll show you the city. You click on it again and you expand and you can actually get down to the street level and it will tell you where coronavirus cases occurred in the last 14 days. And as a case matures, it, it turns to green and then finally disappears. But if it's red, you know that that case occurred there within the last three days. And if you were in that area, then, you know, again, it's a signal from the government that if you were in that area and you develop the symptoms that perhaps you should see a healthcare provider. Um, Shown below here is what an emergency alert looks like. And it's usually accompanied by vibration and a very loud and irritating alarm. Um, but it provides emer emergency information. It has social distancing reminders. So my, my daughters were a little upset uh, when one weekend when the cherry blossoms and the tulips were out and people were planning to go out and look at them, they got an instruction that people should keep at least uh, two meters distant and um, Younger people should not hold hands. Um, and I think that was a, a, a bit of a reminder that, um, you know, Korea was still in a, in a phase where they didn't mandate that people stay at home, but they wanted people to keep their distance and avoid crowds. It also gave you the latest information on testing, identification of hotspots and location of, case, of cases. And then, you know, as I, I was uh, saying before, when you click on it, 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 the emergency alert and you translate it, it'll tell you, for instance, this one's from Gangnam which is um, where Gangnam style, the song comes from. Um, but you go to the Gangnam Gu website, the district office website, and you keep clicking and it'll tell you uh, that a case has been identified, where the case is, um, you know, and, and tracking their movements so that um, if you need to, uh, or if you have symptoms, you can report that to your healthcare provider. So other government measures included, um, so telemedicine is not approved in Korea, but it is now um, because they recognize that for many routine visits, you don't want people to go to um, into the doctor's office because that's where sick people are. So if you happen to be 80 years old and need a refill on one of your medicines, um, you can use telemedicine uh, rather than have to go into a doctor's office where you might be exposed to um, illness. Uh, for lower income families, now again, schools were put off by an extra month. Um, 
January is usually a break period anyway, but they put, kept putting school off. And finally, uh, when they started school, um, they provided wireless bases for lower income families because one of the problems in Korea, as it is in many parts of the world, is that you know, you're fine if you are on, in Seoul and you have access to citywide Wi-Fi. Um, it's more of a problem if you are in a family or in a location where you don't have access to wireless services. They streamed ex extra educational content on TV. And so many of the you know, several hundred So colleagues, I think we've just had a internet pause there from Jerome. Um, let's just hang on and see if that reconnects. Apologies for that. Oops. I'm afraid that if I- Yeah, go... I think it was an internet pause. You're back now, thank you. All right, sorry so about you go, that. If you don't mind sharing your slides again, Jerome, sorry. Okay, okay. let's see. Uh, Zoom. Uh, let's see. No, it's not working. Um, okay, well, we uh, have your. Uh, are you okay? No, I've got it. Share screen. Okay. Yeah. Go. Great. All right. And then this one. Is that fine? That's perfect, thank you. Great. So, um, so say you come into the airport, you're, you're required to download this code now, uh, this track, this um, self-diagnosis app, and which also serves as a tracking app for inbound travelers who are not Korean citizens. Um, you get these codes at the airport, and every day you're, you're sent one of these forms that gives you, you know, do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Do you have shortness of breath? Uh, do you have anything else that you want to report? If you don't respond, the government officer assigned to your case will call you from your district office. If again, you don't respond, they'll come and visit you. If you don't respond and don't respond to visits, then after two days, they have the right to expel you. Uh, if you're caught outside without your phone, because again, if you leave your phone behind, um, you, um, you are penalized. If, they, if you happen to um, walk out with your phone, then the tracking app will notify the government that you're not where you're supposed to be and they'll call you. So this again is, for, is to enforce the idea that you, know, you are under isolation, you shouldn't go outside. Most people who are in self-isolation are able to, so in Korea, you know, many, many things are available online. You can order food online, you can get groceries online. So really you don't have to leave your um, residence. And in fact, if you're in one of the quarantines then you're not allowed to leave your residence. So the self-quarantine safety app from March 7th, from the 7th of March, this was available for people who are under quarantine It monitors symptoms and location. And the government case officers have a complimentary app to be able to access the things that you put in on yours. And they actually do do random house visits in order to you know, make sure that you are where you're supposed to be. Um, so this is the Infectious Diseases Prevention and Control Act of 2010. Actually, there, are, there was a previous act that went back into the 1970s, I believe. Um, but it was amended after the 2015 MERS outbreak and then amended again in 2017. So you saw the colors, blue means that the government is watching something. Yellow means there's a case in Korea, orange local spread and red national spread. So um, the government acquires certain policies and responsibilities at the state, local, and, and local level at the national and local levels. Um, and as the ability to mobilize medical personnel. Um, and it defines the rights of each of these organizations um, and gives uh, people uh, responsibility as well. So when an infectious disease um, is thought to be harmful and is spreading, the Minister of Health and Welfare has to promptly disclose information to the citizens, uh, which are required for acquainting them with the infectious disease and um, the government gains the ability to check your movement paths, the way you um, got from one place to another. So in one case, in the very beginning, when they were still reporting things like this, uh, the person had traveled uh, by car and passed through uh, toll gates and the toll gates recorded. So the government actually knew exactly uh, where you had gone. They have the right to access credit card transactions. They can, they can get information from medical institutions and as well access the contacts of the patients um, 
with the infectious disease without a warrant. And so all of this was decided by the government uh, long before uh, the outbreak occurred. And, and this is the kind of thing which each country, I think, will need to evaluate with regard to the rights to privacy that, that individuals have. And you know, better to debate this um, before an outbreak than during an outbreak, um, when you know, uh, people aren't necessarily going to be thinking um, in a systematic and rational way, which is what you need when you, when you address concerns around privacy. Whoops. Uh, this is the control. So level three, the highest level, the red alert level. Uh, at that point, then the prime minister becomes the head of the effort, which gives the authority over multiple ministries, including the ministries that support implementation, like the Ministry of Interior and Safety, and then the health aspects, which are the Ministry of Health and Welfare. And so, you know, in, you can imagine that if there were an earthquake, you know, the Ministry of Interior and Safety might be the prime, but during an outbreak, the Ministry of Health and Welfare becomes the most important ministry and is the number one deputy of the prime minister. And that these laws then apply all the way down to the local government and allow the, the central government to coordinate disaster relief uh, with the local government. And actually in response to complaints, for instance, regarding privacy or, or disclosure of names, the, um, the KCDC received complaints and then had to reinforce the rules with the local government. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the kind of information that can be collected uh, under the law. History of using medical facilities, GPS at um, roaming signals, uh, credit card transaction laws, and access to CCTV tapes. And again, a lot of these will help to verify. When um, information is being made known to the public, names are not provided. So you don't know the person who was in our local supermarket, just that there was a person who was COVID-19 positive, uh, who was at the supermarket uh, for the following 15 minute uh, time frame. Um, again, if you've been exposed and you develop symptoms, please uh, go and uh, have a COVID-19 test. So practically, this has a lot of implications, right? I mean, it's one thing for the government to say, stay six feet away from someone, uh, you know, wash your hands well, no um, coughing. But of course, this being Korea, uh, entrance exams are really important. And so this is the situation on the far left, taking exams in 2020. Uh, what you see um, in some of the other illustrations are the people who do decontamination and, and some, um, some friends had a, had a positive case. And the government in fact does come with these, um, with these spray things to spray the outside of the house and give you instructions and the equipment to clean up inside the house. Um, what you see there are the mobile test centers and the, the phone booth test centers. And then probably the most incredible thing happened um, a week ago, a little less than a week ago, which was lining up for, which was actually having a general election for the National Assembly. So what you see on the far left are people spaced out, socially distanced, waiting in line to enter the polling station. When you get in uh, to the polling station, you were um, given hand sanitizer to wash your hands, you were given gloves, you were given masks, or if you didn't have your mask, all the Koreans in, in the picture have their mask on. And then you were given your ballot you vote, you return the ballot, you put your gloves into a plastic bag, you wash your hands and you leave. 66% of people, despite this hassle, ended up voting. And even if you were under quarantine, you were able to vote in a specially constructed booth uh, for people who are positive. So again, to try to let life continue, I mean, if this is a glimpse of the new normal, um, you know, every e effort was made to ensure that all this national function, this very important um, duty of the electorate to vote was was carried out. And I, we were just, when my wife and I were joking, we watched some Korean historical films every now and then. And so this is taking exams in 2020. This is what they used to do during the Chosun dynasty 400 years before. Looks remarkably similar, but in that case, it was, I think, to decrease cheating. Um, oops. Now, briefly then into SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. Um, this is just a, a, a schematic of the virus itself. Um, probably the most important thing, and we think it's important because that's where the neutralizing antibodies are generated or are, are directed, is the spike protein, the S protein of the coronavirus. Um, you can also see uh, something here called the uh, nucleocapsid protein. Um, nucleocapsid is important because they think that secondary responses to the nucleocapsid protein may be, um, may be uh, the source of non-neutralizing antibody, uh, which actually may be something that we don't want to generate. Um, 
So this is a, a 3D molecular structure of the receptor binding domain, sorry, of the spike protein here, which is a trimer. So you see the three, the two white pieces and the dark blue piece. The, or, the, the purple, the lavender section is the receptor binding domain and neutralizing antibodies against the receptor binding domain uh, may neutralize not only uh, the current uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also SARS-CoV-1, not because there's a lot of sequence similarity, but because there's similarity in structure. What you see in the next section um, are, the, are the different kinds of vaccines that could be developed, and in fact, for this vaccine, for this particular virus are being developed. Uh, the RNA and DNA vaccines are nucleic acid vaccines, and as you can imagine, once you have the sequence of the virus, uh, work on an RNA vaccine or a DNA vaccine is relatively uncomplicated. I mean, uncomplicated in the sense that you can design the vaccine, you know, the next day you can go to the lab and, and begin to construct it uh, or make it an RNA vaccine. Uh, with recombinant protein vaccines, these are a little more complicated because you have to introduce the genetic sequence into a, into a cell line like uh, Chinese hamster ovary cells or Vero cells or, um, or similar cell lines that are used for vaccine manufacture. That takes a bit more time. It's a lit, little more difficult to set up a platform, uh, you know, a commonly used uh, system to generate these proteins, although some groups have done it, like the University of Queensland group in Australia. Vectored vaccines. Now, this would be a vaccine similar to the one that um, Professors Hill and Gilbert are testing from Oxford. Um, in their case, it's a simian adenovirus, but you, you have other things, uh, vesicular, stomatonic, vesicular stomatitis virus, uh, measles virus. Uh, lots of viruses are being used uh, with tiny bits of the SARS-CoV-2 genome in them, uh, typically of the spike domain, um, to generate um, immune responses against the targeted genetic sequence. Inactivated vaccines, you know, those are probably the oldest type of vaccine. You just grow the vaccine up in a cell line and kill it with heat or formaldehyde. Um, and those vaccines are used, um, the inactivated polio vaccine is a, is a prime example of an inactivated vaccine. And then, you know, one of the best vaccines that we have if we can generate one are live attenuated vaccines like the measles vaccine. Those vaccines are great because if you give, you know, two doses, you know, you have 95 to 98% efficacy and you're protected for the rest of your life. Uh, and those are great vaccines, but they take a bit longer to develop. What you see on the right is what normally takes five to 10 years with the average vaccine. And, and I'll actually go through the, the time frame for the COVID-19 um, vaccine, which is now reduced from five to 10 years to, six, to between six to 18 months. Um, we used to say 12 to 18 months, but I think um, maybe uh, some of the vaccines might be ready sooner than that. Um, but this assumes that everything works. So it could very well be longer. But first now, okay, as a, as a scientist who does vaccine development, let's look at the, um, the known unknowns. The first is, does infection provide immunity? And why is this important? Well, in a classical vaccine disease model, and, and for this, just use hepatitis A as an example, although the disease may have a variable course in any one individual, um, and you know, with different complications in, in different individuals, by and large, almost all people recover completely. So the immune response that's generated during the course of infection manages to eliminate the virus and people recover. That means that those vaccine-induced immune responses, you know, if a person gets hepatitis A and is immune from further uh, infections with hepatitis A, it means that the vaccine-generated immune responses that cleared the virus and protect you against infection. And that would be a pretty good sign that if we were able to do the same thing with a, with a vaccine, then we would be able to, um, uh, sorry, if we were able to do the same thing with the vaccine, then we would have a pretty good likelihood that the vaccine would protect against infection. Now, remember though, that for some viruses like Epstein-Barr virus or cytomegalovirus, HIV or TB, the host immune system does not contain the virus, does not eliminate the pathogen. And in those cases, development of that vaccine has been much more complicated. And, and you know, having worked in HIV vaccines for nearly all of my career, I can tell you, you know, viruses that uh, don't prevent reinfection uh, can be a real problem. We hope, we believe that COVID-19 is one of the classic vaccine disease models that infection uh, with COVID-19 confers immunity against infection. We don't know for how long that protection lasts, um, 
But at least in the short term, as long as we've known it, uh, so I guess four months, um, those people who are infected do not look like they can be reinfected. That will come up again uh, at the end. The second big question is what immune responses are important for clearing an infection? So typically for vaccines, it's antibody, infection fighting proteins that bind to and inactivate virus or allow the immune system to target the, the virus with or bacterium with other effector mechanisms, you know, um, cells that will um, uh, identify the FC portion of the, the antibody and uh, kill virally infected cells. We'd, we'd also hope that um, T cells, in particular cytotoxic T cells, might be very important in clearance. And, and in fact, there's some suggestion that for the coronaviruses, that a Th1 cellular immune response is very important, that having an appropriate balance between humoral responses and cellular responses is probably more important than it is in, in many uh, of the other vaccines that we've developed. But we don't know which immune responses are important. We're assuming that antibody is, and there's some suggestion that cells are also. The next important question is, what is the appropriate animal model? Um, and what's shown in the picture is a, actually a monkey and a mouse or a rat. Um, and, and really that's the dichotomy, right? I mean, we can test a, a vaccine for the production of correct immune responses in mice, in rabbits, in, in monkeys, um, but really the ultimate target population is not a monkey, it's to protect humans against infection and disease with COVID-19. So which of these animal models will accurately predict what we will find in humans? And that's a critical question because vaccine trials are expensive. And we like as much evidence possible that a vaccine that we take into humans will actually work and protect humans. The last part, and, and we can't emphasize this enough because as much as, Im as important as it is to have a vaccine that is efficacious, that is effective at preventing infection and disease, we also have to design vaccines that are safe. Because in the end, the vaccine is given to a healthy person and, and we want to keep that healthy person healthy. And that's actually a picture of one of the early anti-vaxxer cartoons. It was actually, he was making fun of the anti-vaxxers. So in this case, um, after Jenner introduced uh, cowpox as a vaccine for smallpox, people were afraid that if they injected the cowpox into them, that cows would suddenly sprout from their arms. Um, and we know that that's not true. In fact, we know that that vaccine eliminated smallpox. All right, so under normal circumstances, it does take five to 10 years to make a vaccine. And you can see the process here and you see the stages, discovery and ex exploration, preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, approval, and then production. And you see the boxes getting smaller and smaller. And that's because on the average, only one in 10 of the vaccines that starts actually is marketed. So you, if you're a big uh, vaccine company, say GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, you're looking at uh, vaccine development and you're thinking, my goodness, for every 10 vaccines that I start in discovery, I'll get one that I make money on. Um, and it will take five to 10 years. So it takes a long time and there's a high risk of failure. Um, and you can see why vaccine companies sometimes are reluctant to move forward. Luckily, I think because of the nature, the size, the extent of this outbreak, almost all of the big vaccine manufacturers are now in the game. And, and that's really critical. I think the interesting thing is now we're taking that 10 year time frame and we're telescoping it. So the accelerated schedule for a COVID-19 vaccine is between six and 18 months. And how are we going to do that when the phases typically run sequentially? So you can see phase one, which is the safety phase, phase two, where we really do a deep dive into immunogenicity in the target population. So is the vaccine making the right responses in the population that we want to use the vaccine in? And you know, those trials are two to 500 people. Phase three in thousands of people is the most expensive um, and sometimes the most complex of the phases. That's in the um, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, in a typical vaccine development pathway. And now we are compressing this five to 10 year process down to six to 18 months. People use the word unprecedented over and over again when they talk about the schedule. If everything works, if the vaccine is found to be safe and effective at the end of 18 months, um, I think we will be in a good position. So vaccine development is costly and risky. 
The estimated cost of developing a vaccine, this is from the Gates Foundation Open Research. Actually, this is a group from the Gates uh, that was involved in this research, 400 million to $1 billion. And Sir Andrew Whitty, who was, used to be the CEO of GSK and is now the WHO's coordinator for this response, said that billion dollar estimates are one of the great myths of the industry. So I'm not sure if he meant that he didn't believe it um, or that, that there were some other way of calculating the cost. Um, the failure rate, 93%. Um, so with high cost, high risk and low incentive, you know, how are we gonna develop a vaccine that 7 billion people in this world will be able to access at a reasonable cost? Oops. This is a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine pipeline as of the 15th of, I'm sorry, the 8th of April. There were 115 candidates by 78 active and 73 preclinical. Um, the ones that are confirmed, um, are the active ones. And um, the ones that are preclinical, that, that is that they're active research programs that have been identified for them. 73 preclinical means that these are the vaccines that are now in animals and in animal testing. Uh, and then phase one, and I'll actually have a slide on that uh, in, subsequently, are the vaccines that are actually in humans. So you can see already the, the rapid decrease in the number of vaccines that have actually so far made it into humans. But this is remarkable. I mean, we did not know about this uh, in Christmas of 2019. And now there are 115 different candidates of different kinds. And this is actually from Nature Reviews and Drug Discovery. So it's, it's available if you'd like to read more about it. These are the vaccines in phase one testing. Moderna was the first out the gate on um, the 17th of March. So again, six weeks after the award of its contract, it had begun to test a vaccine in humans, a very small, um, group in a phase one study, you can see, and of, of 45, so 45 volunteers. Inovio began uh, earlier in April, I think on the 12th of April, uh, Inovio began its injections. Again, a small phase one study of 40 volunteers. The Jenner Institute, which has actually started its study in the UK, will enroll 510 people, but this is actually designed as a phase one slash two, an example of what I called telescoping before, where you tend to put tend to overlap the phases in order to expedite um, development of the vaccine. They're using a CHADOX or, or a simian um, non-replicating uh, chip adenovirus. CanSino is a Chinese company. They have an adenovirus also. Uh, they've enrolled their phase one of 108 people and phase two should be starting this month. And the Beijing Institute of Biological Products started its phase one with a whole inactivated vaccine in alum. Um, and again, so these are currently ongoing. And remember, this is, is really remarkable progress uh, for an organ, for groups like ours that, that typically tell people it'll be five to 10 years before we have a vaccine. So this is the phase uh, one slash two clinical trial that we're planning uh, to do in Korea uh, if things go right. It's funded by the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which has really been critical in accelerating the development of vaccines for outbreaks. Um, this is a collaboration with the small American biotech known as Inovio that does DNA vaccines delivered by something called electroporation, which is um, a bit of an electric shock. Um, and you can see the design of, this, of the trial here. It's 160 individuals. Uh, it should hopefully start the 1st of June. So people often ask, will this end up like SARS-1 uh, from 2002 or MERS with no vaccine? So SARS-1 and, and MERS were different diseases with different pathogen-specific features that make them different from COVID-19. COVID-19 has a higher transmissibility than SARS, tenfold greater mortality than flu, and unlike MERS, 80% of the infected, mildly asymptomatic people are capable of spreading the disease. Uh, with MERS, transmission was, was very low and is typically only among family members or among uh, people who are helping that patient in the hospital. With SARS, we knew who was sick and they were the ones who were transmitting. So these diseases are very different in their biology and that biology translates to the tremendous suffering that we're seeing around the world uh, today. So I think that the fact that SARS has been around, uh, sorry, COVID-19 has been around uh, for four months, continues to spread and continues to cause both infections and death is a good sign that um, this, is, this will not be uh, what we ended up with with SARS-1 and MERS, and that we are more likely to see a vaccine developed uh, during the course of this illness. Just a brief bit on, on how much outbreaks like this cost. Um, the World Bank estimated that outbreaks in the 21st century would cost us $6 trillion. Um, MERS at that point had cost $10 billion. 
The SARS outbreak in 2002, 40 billion. Ebola um, in 2014 was 6 billion. COVID-19 already uh, is raising estimates of two to $4 trillion. So we are a good way into that $6 trillion estimate that the World Bank put together. Outbreaks are expensive and not preparing for outbreaks is even more expensive. So I think, I hope that one of the lessons learned here uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak is the need to be prepared and the need to support organizations like CEPI that will providing collective defense against um, outbreak diseases. So this is um, um, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations from the start, the announcement of the request for proposals in 2017 to the first acceptance of proposals in July of 2017, CEPI has been planning for this outbreak with Disease X. So shortly after the, um, the announcement of the sequence and, and the disease known as COVID-19, um, CEPI was soliciting requests for proposals from companies and organizations that had platforms that could rapidly develop vaccines with a goal to have vaccines in, in human subjects within four months. And you can see that a number of the organizations were very successful at that. So, and I, I don't want to keep harping on safety because as a vaccine developer, I really want a safe, I want an effective vaccine against COVID-19. But safety is always an issue. And this um, outbreak in particular, there was an issue raised not with SARS-CoV-2, but with its cousin, the original SARS. And, and this has raised um, red flags for some of us, uh, actually for many of us, because you know all of the people who develop vaccines um, are committed to having um, safe as well as effective vaccines. And this was the issue. Um, it typically happened uh, in mice that received whole inactivated vaccines. And you can see that the vaccines actually protected the mice against um, challenge with SARS-CoV. So remember, this is the original SARS. And you can see that here. In terms of uh, weight after, the, after um, experimental vaccination and infection. And the, the ones in, in the open circles are the ones that have been vaccinated. Um, what you see here is the actual uh, virus titer. And again, comparing, um, just looking at lung, there's a two log difference between um, this and, and, un, and untreated. What's really interesting is the development of monoclonal anti uh, sorry, neutralizing antibody after vaccination. And what's even, um, sorry, oops. More interesting here is that despite that protection that was seen, um, in certain groups, you saw eosinophilic infiltration of the lung. Uh, despite protection, you were seeing these pulmonary infiltrates, what has been called enhanced pulmonary disease. Um, this has been described multiple times, and this is unpublished work summarizing a lot of the, the studies that were done. And you can tell these are all with either MERS or SARS-CoV, um, that there were a lot of demonstrations that sometimes uh, you saw protection with lung infiltration or enhanced disease, but it didn't seem to have any really clear pattern for SARS-CoV, and it appeared to be much less of a problem for MERS-CoV. So the differences that, that obtained by um, differences in sequence or you know, uh, relatedness of the SAR, different SARS um, and MERS coronaviruses seem to confer some difference in susceptibility to this disease um, after vaccination and challenge. And it really raised some, some confusing issues as, as we're trying to sort through what to do and, and how to do it for SARS-CoV-2 or uh, COVID-19. So is there any pattern to the enhanced disease seen in vaccinated animals after challenge? So we really don't know. It looked like it was seen more often with SARS-CoV than with MERS. We don't know what it's gonna be uh, for SARS-CoV-2, although there is a preprint available um, of a group from uh, Sinovac, so you can download it from the internet, um, that shows that with the SARS-CoV-2 whole inactivated vaccine, uh, vaccinating rhesus macaques, um, that they saw protection against infection and no enhancement of disease. So with SARS-CoV-2, perhaps we'll see something different than we saw with SARS-CoV-1. But it's, again, something that we need to be aware of, that we need to incorporate into the design of studies and follow-up. Um, people have also raised the question, is there antibody-dependent enhancement? That is, does the presence of antibodies, particularly low levels of antibodies, um, increase viral replication? Uh, and you can see from the previous um, data that, that we did re really didn't think that this was the case, 
Um, but again, this is something that we'll need to monitor because again, we've learned from the, the experience with Invexia um, that there are some instances where you know, we really do need to, to have longer term follow-up after vaccination. It appeared to be animal model specific, much more common in mice and smaller animals than in, in non-human primates. Um, what vaccine types were associated with this? But uh, you know, was whole inactivated virus more of a problem than virally vectored uh, vaccines, or, or more, which were more of a problem than subunit vaccines? But again, you know, when you look at the studies, um, sometimes the data were confusing. Um, and then were Th2 predominant um, responses more prone to develop this? Again, we're not really sure. So what is now the road to what an American president called normalcy, the return to normalcy? So the natural history of multi-year COVID-19 outbreaks will lead to herd immunity, creating immunological distance at a cost of 70% mortality in the elderly, 14% rates of hospitalization, and 2% mortality in the average person, kind of a Darwinian approach to return to normalcy. But this is the way um, we dealt with epidemics in the past, before we had vaccines, before we had advanced medical care. Or could we have vaccines that will protect and when enough people are vaccinated, we'll have the same level of herd immunity. That would be the ideal situation. Um, could we do better to establish a new normal with effective medication, prophylactic antibiotics, prophylactic medication? It wouldn't be what we had before COVID-19, but it might be better than the, you know, the normal that we're experiencing now. And the final thing is like SARS-1, the disease might simply disappear, disappear or might become chronic and seasonal with multiple circulating uh, strains that periodically change. And again, this is something that's almost impossible to predict, you know, um, and we don't know, but I think that given the way SARS-CoV-2 is moving through the global population and into areas of the world where healthcare and resources are limiting, um, I think that this will probably be with us for uh, quite some time. So this is in conclusion. Um, so when you're developing vaccines, we really start with a box in blue. We're looking at having a vaccine delivered by vaccination programs that deliver the things that vaccines should do, not only lives saved and decreased disease, but also all the other things that vaccines um, contribute to, healthier families, decreased poverty, improved, um, better educational attainment and economic growth. And all these things happen if we have vaccination programs which are dependent on then on having a vaccine. And that's why you know, uh, groups like CEPI, IBI, uh, and many others, the Jenner Institute at Oxford, developed these global health vaccines uh, to begin with. But this is not a, si a simple process, right? There are uh, manufacturers. Um, you have to develop these clinically and clinically test them. You have to get approval from the MHRA or the US FDA or the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety in Korea. Uh, for vaccines that are going to be used around the world, that is vaccines that are going to be used in low, uh, low and middle income countries, we have to get the World Health Organization approval called pre-qualification, which allows UN agencies like UNICEF to purchase the vaccine for Gavi, which is the vaccine stockpile. Remembering that, um, you know, a country like um, Tanzania is not going to be able to afford a $200 a dose vaccine. So mechanisms exist through Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and through purchases by UNICEF and negotiations with the company to provide lower cost vaccine uh, to countries that can't afford it. CEPI, because it's a coalition of countries um, like the United Kingdom, Norway, Japan, India, um, and organizations like the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust actually has access written into the contracts that it makes with companies. How those access agreements will play out in the end, I think, is something that we're all very interested to see. But many of the, the people at, at CEPI, at the WHO, at IBI, and, and, and Gavi are really, and, the, and other UN agencies, are really committed to the idea of equity and access um, around the world. And again, these are some of the other things that go into how we get from the vaccine to impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim, that was excellent. So we've got a lot of questions. We're not gonna be able to get through them all. We've only got about six minutes left. And so I'm just going to go through the ones that were most popular. There are a couple of questions on vaccines, which I think we may need to send you by email. So in terms of the um, uh, press attention in the UK today, we're expecting an announcement on masks. 
So you didn't touch on mask usage in South Korea. Could you just briefly cover that and whether you think they actually offer any real protection to the population? So um, they definitely protect healthcare workers. They also protect, they may protect family members of a person who's known to be infected. So wearing a mask, if you know you have COVID-19 infection or influenza, um, there's some evidence that would suggest that it does protect uh, people around you. In the population, the data are much more mixed. Uh, there are some people who suggest that it, uh, it does protect and other people who say that it doesn't. It definitely keeps you from touching your face with your hands uh, directly, uh, which has a beneficial effect. In countries like the United States, where you don't know who's infected, the mask, presumably, then you're, uh, when, we, when the United States was asking people to wear masks, what it was saying is we don't know who's infected. And if you don't know who's infected and you know, 20 to 40% of people are completely asymptomatic but are infected and are capable of spreading the disease, then if everyone wears a mask, then maybe the evidence would suggest that we do reduce um, the risk of transmission to others, not necessarily protecting yourself, but definitely protecting others, which is also an important part of, of, of what governments need to do. The other thing is, you know, again, this gets to the idea that you, this, the data that you can, a government, your government, you're looking at the data and you're thinking, now, what does this say? You have to make a decision. And, you know, countries in Asia, and I don't know if you've ever been here in the winter or when the air pollution is bad, but lots of people wear masks. In fact, it feels a little out of place not to wear a mask. Um, and so when, during flu season, you do, in fact, again, see people wearing masks. And again, it's the, I, I think that people have the idea that you know, not only do they wanna protect themselves, but a lot of them are saying, well, I'm coughing and sneezing and I don't wanna make anyone else at work sick. And, and if that's the approach that the governments are taking, then you know, again, they're looking at the government and the situation in the country and, and trying to make a judgment. Um, hopefully there are enough masks. I mean, in Korea now there's a, a somewhat rationing system. Um, you can buy masks, um, but you can also get them at greatly reduced cost or free um, on certain days of the week, depending on who you are and, and your birthday. Great, that's really helpful. And I think will be very, very informative for us. So just on the social distancing app, another issue that is uh, um, occupying us here. So what proportion of the population have the app? And you know, I think the, the question was, is it automatically downloaded? But my understanding would be people have to download it themselves. Correct. And, and I think, for instance, if you come in the airport, um, you have to download it if you want to, you know, be on quarantine and, and be in Korea. And I, part of the reason for that is that, you know, the government wants to know where you are, um, particularly since they're, you know, people are still allowed in with the visas. So, you know, it's a, it's a protective mechanism. Within the country, um, you know, the, all you have to do is hit the notifications button on your iPhone. I don't know what it is on an Android phone and the alerts come up automatically. And it's, it, you can silence them, but they still come up on your screen. Uh, if you turn them off, then you don't get them. Okay, that's helpful. And Aziz, I see you've joined us. And were you wanting to ask a question, Aziz? Um, so first of all, Jerome, I, I thought that was an absolutely fantastic presentation. So um, thank you um, so much um, for that. So you've obviously got experience of living in other countries and how much of this um, approach, this quite invasive government level approach, do you think uh, to monitoring movements, et cetera, is potentially transferable to a place like Scotland or the UK? Uh, that's interesting. Um, so I had a discussion actually with some American friends, um, being American, and, and then um, also with some people in Korea. But, you know, having been to the UK a, a few occasions, I've actually been um, surprised by the number of cameras that you have surveilling, I mean, you know, just in the streets. Um, it's, it's really kind of remarkable. Um, and then also, you know, for instance, in America, you know, the government actually was given special powers under the terrorist acts. And, um, you know, so their ability to look into phones and get records and special courts and, you know, those things are, are something that the government has to weigh as it's looking at privacy versus um, security. And in a way, you know, an outbreak is, as the Koreans have a, a you know, system for outbreak uh, diseases, diseases threaten the health security and the national security. And so I think a government needs, and a people, I guess, this is a discussion that should occur not during an outbreak, but, but hopefully uh, in between outbreaks. Um, this is a real um, philosophical decision that, that governments should make and take. Um, 
because you know as you're looking at releasing and the potential for you know hundreds tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of new infections and you know and a, a cognate number of deaths um, you know a government needs to look at what it needs it to do in order to allow the freedom to move um, and what control mechanisms have to be put into place to allow them to get on top of infections as they occur. I mean, in the United States, um, we still have um, notification laws. If you're, you know, have um, an infectious disease, um, the public health system could theoretically notify contacts of someone with a sexually transmitted disease. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that, you know, where you're not only protecting an individual's rights, but you're protecting the people that he or she uh, may have exposed. And, and I think that's a balance that every government has to, uh, a discussion every government has to make. But I would put it to you that, that we've already made that decision with regard to terrorism. Um, many countries have. And you know, this is a disease that's killed more people than any terrorist attack um, in the UK or in the United States. So those are, are things for us to ponder and, and very important, I think. And um, we've run out of time, colleagues, and I'm so sorry because there were some really excellent questions. So we will send those to Professor Kim. We can see who's asked them and make sure that you get the answers for those. Uh, so Jerome, just to thank you sincerely again uh, for what was a really excellent uh, presentation. Um, and I, I know colleagues will be taking that away and highlighting the link on the YouTube uh, live stream for colleagues who've not been able to join us. So just to conclude, I'm going to mention our um, next two webinars. Please do come and join us on the 30th of April next week at 1 p.m., slightly different time, for uh, Dr. Yodi Alakija, who is a previous former Chief Humanitarian Coordinator in Nigeria. She's going to give a, quite a different presentation, actually, from a human rights perspective on the challenges of dealing with COVID in African countries. And then the following week, this is a new announcement. We're really delighted that Dr. Tai uh, from NIHG in Vietnam, an epidemiologist, is going to join us. Some of you will know that Vietnam has had very few cases and has been very successful to date. So we look forward to hearing from him. And do keep an eye out on the email for some announcements about the middle week in between those two weeks, May the 7th, where we're planning a, a special uh, extended webinar on lockdown release strategies uh, that Susan and team are currently liaising with uh, colleagues, both in the usher and externally, who will speak on that. And that will be over three hours. So please, Keep an eye out for that additional uh, webinar on lockdown release. Uh, so I'll say goodbye to everybody now. Thank you again to Professor Kim. Um, and as I say, we'll follow up with the slides and with answers to those additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. So you can.